in your Bibles, if you can uh, turn to Ezekiel in chapter 38. We're going to spend two weeks on this theme that starts in 38 and continues on uh, chapter 39 next week. And as we uh, come to this area, I hope that we would be excited as I am about going over this again. I would have heard this uh, teaching probably over 40 years ago and uh, my view has remained the same and continue to be excited about it because it is clear that what we are looking at here in chapter 38 is in the latter times. It's sometime in our time. And it is clear as we go through this passage that Israel is back in the land. So we know that it couldn't have happened sometime in the past. Israel is in the land uh, when this attack occurs. And what we're going to look at tonight is I'm going to suggest some things as to when I believe it will happen. There are a few various thoughts on this, but I want to, to share with you what I believe according to the, the context of what we will see of when this attack uh, what, of what we believe is Russia and the uh, allies with it will attack uh, Israel. And so let's come to the word of God in a moment, but we'll come to the Lord in prayer first. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, uh, as, we, as we bow our hearts before you at this time, we bow in humility, in awe of your word. Lord, that you have not left us in the dark. Lord, you have shown us that you are working according to your promises in bringing Israel back into the land, although they do not know you as a majority. Uh, Lord, you have um, kept your promises, Lord. You've kept your promises. And they are in the land, coming back to the land. And Lord, what we see tonight will show them in the land, still not trusting in you. But Lord, it shows that you are always working and that your word will be fulfilled. Lord, speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've entitled the message tonight, uh, The Attack of the Northern Alliance. And what is incredible about this whole uh, passage is it's written thousands of years ago, and yet it is so up to date. Where there is some debate is probably over who are the identities that are mentioned here, but I believe as we look at it, we get an idea of who it has to be. And so we start to form a picture of what is, is happening. So Ezekiel 38, and we're going to deal with it a little bit differently tonight, in that uh, we will look at uh, the actual peoples that are mentioned here. And I want to be up front first so that you know where I'm going with this. I believe as we go through it, you would hopefully see, as I do, I'm not going to force you on this, but it makes sense most to see that this will probably happen, this attack that is spoken of here, I believe at the beginning of the tribulation time. And uh, we see the elements coming together very, very clearly. Everything is ready in place. And so I want us to think about this. If the Lord was to come back tonight at the rapture, I believe that these events would be happening pretty much straight after. And so I'll explain why I believe that this is the case of where this fits into. I'll start reading, though, from verse 1 and 2 down to verse 3. And what we want to do straight away is we want to identify who it is that is going to attack Israel. And as we go through this, you'll find that Israel is in a strange situation. And I believe that this is so, so key. Israel is in a situation where they are at peace. It says that they are dwelling in unwalled villages. They're not expecting attack of any sort. Not certainly... A, uh, at that time, they're not expecting an attack, whereas we know now, surrounded by the enemy, they're expecting attack all the time. 
And so this is a different situation to what we find in the news. Israel does not expect an attack. They're living at peace. And the question that we need to ask is, how is this possible? When you visit Israel and you, you see the armed forces all around you, you know that they are on edge all the time. And particularly at the moment, it's increasing again. Surrounded by what some are calling the wall of fire, expecting that any time, at any time, that they will be attacked and ready for it. And so what you read here in Ezekiel is not the way it is now. Israel is dwelling at peace for some reason. It's an important question to answer. And so as we come now to the Word of God, looking at who it is that will attack Israel at this time, we know it is in the future because verse 8 says that this is in the latter years. And usually when you see that term in the latter years, it means a long way forward in our time and going forward from there. In the latter years is when this happens. So this is not something that has occurred yet. And I think that is very clear there. So coming to verse 1 of chapter 38. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, remember this was a, a title that was given to, to Ezekiel. Set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against them. And say thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Now as you look at this, there would be those that would say, how can you identify who that is referring to? We get a bit of a clue before we go to some other areas that I believe will show us what is being referred to here. Magog, it is considered, certainly by uh, writers like Josephus, where he interpreted uh, some of these, these nations, these people, we're talking 2,000 years ago, we believe it is up in the area of Russia, uh, is, is what that uh, is referring to. It says there, you can see also, it refers to Meshach and Tubal, and some of these places are hard to identify, but some have identified Meshach as an ancient name for Moscow. For Moscow. And so if that is the case, clearly it is Russia. Perhaps Tubal is the ancient name for Tobolsk, which is a main city in the area of Siberia. So by these names we can identify, I believe, that this is probably referring to Russia. But just in case we're still wondering about that, you look at verses uh, 14 and 15, it says, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, On that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then notice in verse 15, Then you will come from your place out of the far north. Notice it says the far north. It means literally the uppermost part of the north. You and many peoples with you. So it's going to be many that will be identified. We have our, our map before us that you can see. And uh, as you look at this map, you look at Israel here, you would say that, that here is, is Syria, that is the north, but we're talking about the uppermost part of the north and you take a line and you come to the area of Russia. And so I don't think there's any doubt, even though we might struggle with the names, although I believe there are clues there, that this, the enemy that is being referred to here, involves Russia particularly and the Russian peoples and those that are linked with them but we'll see that there is more to this alliance than just them and who would have thought as the Bible being written here thousands of years ago it would be identifying a peoples a nation that we know of today and yet in many ways at this time they were in obscurity if we can put it that way and so it's important, I believe, for us to see that this is the case. It refers there to the Prince of Rosh. Some people have tried to, to get from Rosh, Rosha, Russia, uh, but it simply means a chief. 
I think it, what it is doing there is identifying that there will be a leader that will be a powerful leader that will lead these peoples. Should we look for Putin in that? I don't know. We don't necessarily need to do that. But obviously there is a powerful leader, a chief, that will lead these peoples as an alliance against Israel. But what I want you to be thinking about in all of this is the situation will more than likely be different to what we have now in some respects because remember I see this as fitting into the beginning of the tribulation and we, we know in the beginning of the tribulation that the Antichrist will begin to rise and so we'll look at that and how this would impact upon this passage. I think this is what we need to consider in the light of what we are reading. So I believe that we can fairly, certainly identify Magog and Gog and Meshach and, and Shubal and so on as, as pointing to the Russian peoples. Now it gets easier to identify the next group as you continue on here. Look at verse 5 with me. It says Persia. If, if you find an old map... Uh, not so long ago, you would find on some old maps that where we identify and know Iran as, it is called Persia. And so there's no doubt at all that uh, Persia here being referred to is Iran. It's very interesting that at the, the time that the, the scripture was written here, Persia or Iran as we know it today, was not a powerful kingdom. It, it rose up not long after that. And yet it's being identified as a powerful alliance here. And so with what we're seeing uh, even on the news at the moment, with uh, Iran being behind a lot of the, uh, supporting a lot of those who are in conflict with Israel, they are behind the scenes. But I believe what you're seeing here is that they're going to become more and more active. This is what you see. So Persia is identified, Ethiopia, it certainly is easy to identify it in that it refers to that which is south of Egypt. You can see that if you know your geography, just in this general area here, and uh, Sudan, Ethiopia probably are linked together in this case. And so they are clearly identified. And then you have it mentioning there Libya. Libya is very easy to identify, same name today. We don't have any doubt about that. And so you start to see a bit of a pattern here, don't you? You look at Russia in the north and probably those connected with Russia. You see Iran, you see Sudan, Ethiopia, you see Libya. It's interesting that there are nations around Israel that are not involved with this alliance for some reason and I will put forth some ideas or thoughts as we go into this as to perhaps they are not a part of this alliance because if you were to consider some of these nations that we know of today you have Jordan there you have Syria there you have Iraq you have Saudi Arabia you have Yemen you have Oman and you have the United Arab Emirates, Emirates there and you have Egypt but none of them are mentioned in this particular alliance they're not a part of that. There is perhaps another uh, prophecy regarding Saudi Arabia that is mentioned in this chapter, but I'm going to deal with them uh, and with the, the Tarshish cubs that are mentioned there. Uh, don't tell me to explain this at the moment, but we will focus on them more next week because I believe that's very important to understand them as well. And so you see all of this lining up very, very clearly. Now, as we continue in the Word of God, you'll notice that there is still more, and this rounds out the rest of the alliance. I refer to it as a northern alliance because it shows that it is Russia and the peoples of Russia that seem to be particularly leading this alliance. Now, it's interesting when you, when you ponder upon that. They seem to be the ones particularly leading this alliance. And so as we consider this, we're having to identify in verse 6 who these next group of people are. It mentions Goma. And this is more difficult for us to identify. They are perhaps the Sumerian people, 
probably linked with Russia also. It could include uh, Ukraine, even Germany, uh, even Poland. It could, it could include these peoples. And so it's not so easy to identify them as you consider the Word of God. Interesting with Ukraine. I think when everything happened in Ukraine last year, we, we were thinking, how is this relating to biblical prophecy? It's interesting that Ukraine traditionally has always been identified with Russia. Kiev was, was the center really in many respects of the Russian peoples as such. And so I think as we think forward to the fact that this alliance, as I believe will happen in the beginning of uh, the tribulation, perhaps they will be once again aligned somehow with Russia and uh, maybe not uh, as joined with Russia as a country again, but it seems that they will probably be aligning with Russia at that particular time. I'm not going to be 100% on that, but I see that they are still very much linked together. And so here we are in the political situation that we know of, and uh, we're trying to identify and say, well, you know, is, is Ukraine going to end up being separate? Are they going to be always opposing Russia? It seems from what we can see here in the Word of God that when this attack occurs, that all these peoples are linked together in their attack against whom? Against Israel. So we, we're living in interesting times regarding that. And then as you see there also it mentions the house of Togoma. Many people have identified them as being Turkey, which if you know your recent history, it's very interesting as you think about that because it's really only recently that Turkey ended up not being an ally of Israel. When I went to Israel the first time in 2006, we were allowed to fly over on an Israeli airliner across Turkey because Turkey allowed it, one of the few places around. And that was the way we entered into Israel. And so they, they were at peace with one another and very quickly then it changed. And you can see how easily Turkey would be allied with these groups of people that are mentioned here. So we've seen that change happen in our day and in many respects it seems to be lining up with what we see here. And so the question I would ask in the midst of this before we move too far is why do we have this alliance but why do we have these other peoples surrounding Israel that traditionally are against Israel, why are they not involved with that? And perhaps we'll answer this question as we, as we go through here to see about the reason for the attack and, uh, and maybe in the light of where we are going to help explain why I believe that you do not see these particular nations around Israel involved with this attack that's mentioned in Ezekiel 38, I think it could be good for us to go over to Revelation in chapter 6 because this is the context that I believe that we would put Ezekiel 38 into, Revelation in chapter 6. This is what I want us to think about. And follow along with me here because I believe that this, uh, when you understand it all, will make sense. It all comes together. Revelation chapter 6. What I believe, and if you recall, if you were here last year as we were going through Revelation, we have in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we have the church in heaven. We're caught up to be with the Lord at the rapture. The church is in heaven. But on earth, in chapter 6, is the beginning of the tribulation. And the, the seven seals judgment, I believe, relate to the first half of the tribulation and there's an unfolding. You come to the trumpet judgments. As, as the seal judgments are complete, the trumpet judgments occur, middle of the tribulation, and then you come to the bowl judgments at the end of the tribulation. It's chronologically in order, unfolding, revealing all the way through. And so therefore, this makes sense. The rapture occurs, think of this, the Lord Jesus Christ comes to take us back to be with him. We believe 
from uh, Daniel in chapter 9 and verse 27. It is at that time after the rapture has occurred that the Antichrist makes a peace treaty with Israel. And that is the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. So think about this for a moment. Something happens immediately after the rapture occurs, the Antichrist is able to make some sort of peace treaty with Israel. So all of a sudden, Israel is at peace. And we can only begin to think about what it is that may happen. But somehow or another, the Antichrist is able to to cause a peace to occur and it would relate to those nations, particularly, I believe, that are around Israel and are wanting to attack them now. Somehow or another, Egypt, a major proponent of Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria and so on, and, uh, and, and Iraq, these nations are not involved with the alliance that we see in Ezekiel 38. And perhaps the Antichrist comes along and makes a peace treaty not only with Israel, but stops these other nations from their continued attacks. Something has happened for them not to be involved with this northern alliance that comes down and attacks Israel. There's a lot more that we could go into regarding that. And when we come to Daniel next term, We'll touch on some of those things a little bit more. But I want you to think about this. Chapter 6, Revelation. Straight after the tribulation. Verse 1, the seal is opened and what you are seeing here, I believe, is the Antichrist bringing the peace, bringing the peace treaty to Israel and particularly to the surrounding nations around Israel. So look at verse 1. Now, I saw... When the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, with a voice like thunder, come and see. And notice verse 2, and I looked and behold a white horse, and immediately some would think this is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ coming on a white horse. But it's, it's, it's not in order. It's in Revelation chapter 19 that you see the Lord Jesus Christ clearly identified. Here's the one coming back in victory to judge at the end of the tribulation. Revelation 19 judges, uh, shows us clearly there that he is the faithful and the true. This one is not that one that is referred to here. I looked, verse 2 again, and behold a white horse... He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. We believe that it is deliberate in the way that the scripture mentions a bow, but no arrow. He's come and behind the scenes in in many respects, his thought is war, but he comes in peace. And so I believe that the context is that it is speaking of the Antichrist, who is, who is a counterfeit of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's an antithesis of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's against the Lord Jesus Christ. He's in place of the Lord Jesus Christ. And people will see him as the Christ. They'll see him as the one who is the Messiah that will bring peace. And he'll seem to have all the solutions. And so I looked and behold a white horse and the one who sits on it is going to bring peace. I'm paraphrasing that. And he went out conquering and to conquer. So he's going to be powerful. But notice, and this is important, you continue on the next seal and this is vital to what we're about to consider back in Ezekiel 38. It says in verse 3, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. And another horse, notice, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. So it fits in with what we're, we're seeing. Peace comes to Israel. Israel is dwelling safely because the Antichrist has allowed them to live at peace with the enemy surrounding. And so it seems that now finally Israel has peace and they feel that they are safe within the land. But notice as what we have read there. Let's refer to that again in verse 3 and 4. Notice that it says that very quickly after this there is going to be what? War, violence, violence. And so I believe what you're seeing described there in verse 3 and 4 is this attack from the Russian alliance on Israel. Very soon there is war and the, the war will escalate from there. 
This is in the first half of the tribulation time. And so I believe that that is very much the context of what we're looking at here in Ezekiel and uh, chapter 38. Let's come back to Ezekiel 38 if you're not back there. And we need to ask ourselves, as we look here at the Word of God, why is it, why is it that these, these nations, why is it that this confederacy, why is it that this Russian alliance is, is going to attack Israel? And I think we have an instant reminder as we come to verse 4 of chapter 38 that ultimately everything that happens, God is in control. And it may be strange to us to think that God even allows the Antichrist to do what he does. God is in control. He wants to bring all things to an end. Those that will be deceived by him will be deceived by him, but there'll be those that will turn to the Lord. And so we look at this in verse 4. It says, I will turn you around. The thought is that Russia and the Allies have got their own thoughts of what they're wanting to do, but the Lord is going to turn them around in some way. So they focus where? On Israel. I'm going to turn you around, I'm going to put hooks into your jaws. It literally means the idea of a nose ring. If you have ever been involved with cattle, particularly bulls, you know that the nose ring is something that is put into the bull's nose. It's very sensitive and you're able to um, lead him along just like a lamb. He doesn't like his nose being, being pinched too much. And the thought is here that God is going to, to put a nose ring. He's going to put hooks so that they will come down to attack Israel. They think that it is in their own hearts to do this. And it is in a sense but God is allowing this to happen because he's got his purposes that will be fulfilled. And notice it says, and lead you, lead you. God is allowing this. I'll lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great army with bucklers and shields. Basically, it means with, with armor. And here again, we can look at something like this and, and I know that there are those in the past that said Russia was breeding up horses and, and all those sorts of things. We take the scripture literally until we see that perhaps it could go on to another place. And I don't think it would be out of context as we look at our own, own times that the horses simply mean the, the, the battlements, the, the, the army. It could involve tanks, anything, anything to do with modern warfare. But it, it's, it's a land attack that we are seeing here. It's not an attack from the, from the sea. And really, as we come back to, to our, our map here that clearly shows things, as you look at where Russia is particularly... Uh, we almost uh, uh, couldn't see Russia there for a moment. But as you look at where Russia is, you've got three little countries here. Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, the Caucasus they're referred to. Uh, this is why Russia has been very keen on sort of having control of those areas because it allows them, if they're allied with Iran and Persia, which they will be, they've got a perfect land bridge to come over those mountains and come on down to attack Israel, haven't they? They don't, don't even need to worry about uh, coming into the Black Sea here with their ships and coming through the straits there and coming around to attack. So it makes sense with what you see here. It is a, is a land attack that is occurring. It's, it's clear that that is the case. And so as I said, we don't necessarily need to look for horses, but basically it is an attack from the land, on the land, by by an army made up of this northern alliance. And so you, you see this here. God will cause them. God will cause them to go forth. 38.4. Look at that again. God will be the one who will cause them to go forth and they will be heavily armed is the focus that you see there. The next thing that I want us to see, the reason that they will attack is because they have an evil plan. There is something that is being put into their hearts. There is a wicked scheme that they have that they want to, to, to act the way that they do. Now, I wanted to be careful here 
But imagine the scenario. If this is as I believe it is, if this is the beginning of the tribulation, there is the peace that Antichrist has caused, and yet he still does not have control of the complete world. I, I, I don't believe we see that until the middle of the tribulation. Revelation 13 tells us that. I believe that there is a thought here that he does not have full control over Russia and these other places. But I believe as they are wiped out, he gains more and more control. That certainly makes sense to me to see it that way. And perhaps part of the wicked schemes that is there by Russia and the Allies is to, to try and destroy this peace that the Antichrist has created in a limited way. And we certainly see that in the middle of the tribulation, where is the Antichrist? He's in Jerusalem. He's set himself up as God in the temple. So he is the one that has, in his mind, created this peace in Israel. And so perhaps that could be a part of it. They have an evil plan. They have schemes there. And what is their desire to do? Well, their desire is to, to plunder Israel, verse 12 and 13. And we'll look at those verses there. It says, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited. And what's exciting here is we know that for centuries, Israel was basically uninhabited, Basically, they had waste places, but we know that in our day it is no longer the case. And so we have seen prophecy fulfilled before our eyes and against the people, notice, gathered from the nations, showing us that Israel has come back to the land, gathered from the nations, and they've acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. In other words, they've begun to become wealthy. And some have asked, well, what is the plunder? There's been various thoughts that Israel is wealthy in oil that they haven't tapped into, uh, which they could. There's even some talk of the fact that uh, Israel's wells of oil are so, so deep that if they uh, started taking oil from it, it would uh, drain the oil from the surrounding Arabian countries and so on. I mean, that could be the case. I mean, we know that Israel has got wonderful resources of gas just off in the Mediterranean. But there is another thought that I want us to think about too. If the Antichrist, through this peace treaty, has enabled this peace, a lot of wealth could suddenly go into Israel because there is security in the land. And the wealthy Jews could think, well, now we can invest in a bigger way. We've got, we've got this secure place. Let's develop it even more. That's just a thought that, uh, that I could have. But one way or another, we know that they come down because their desire is for plunder. They desire to take one or another type of wealth from Israel. And clearly that is the case. And so we've got this, uh, this map up here that shows you with the line there. Look at the line from Jerusalem, from, from, uh, from Israel, and you go directly north and you come almost in line with Moscow. And show, so it shows clearly, doesn't it, that the upper north the upper north, has to be Russia. Okay, so when will they attack? And this is a question I've been trying to answer throughout this message tonight. When will they attack? And we need to come, first of all, there to, to verse 8, and I want to remind you that it says, after many days you will be visited in the latter years. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword. Isn't that an interesting phrase? You can say that Israel has been brought back from the sword, the persecution, the suffering that they've gone through. And as a result of that, they've been able to come back into their land. Notice it says that they are gathered from many people and they will be there on the mountains of Israel. Now, I've referred to this uh, a few times recently I believe the mountains of Israel could include all of the nation of Israel, but the mountains of Israel particularly are south of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jerusalem, and going up into Samaria. And what you see here is rather interesting as far as I'm concerned, is that you see that Israel is dwelling on the mountains of Israel, the most important part, and yet they haven't got complete control of that. But they do here. And I think it is partly because of the peace treaty 
that the Antichrist will make with them that they all of a sudden think we've got control of this now. There's a treaty that's being sorted out. We're able to, to claim all of that which belongs to us. And it says there, which has been long desolate, and they were brought out of the nations which Israel has. And notice there, now all of them, notice, they dwell safely. They dwell safely. So you can see this. It's in the latter years, and you can see when it's that they've been gathered back from the sword, they've come from all the lands, the nations of the world, and they've come back to Israel. We see this in our day. It is when Israel is dwelling safely in where? The mountains of Israel. We've seen that. So if you know your geography, if you know your map, as you look at Israel as it is today, you see the West Bank there, and it almost exactly is regarding the mountains of Israel that we've been talking about. You've got the Gaza Strip down the side. But here, here at this time of this attack, Israel is dwelling safely. If you talk to the average Israeli, they would not feel that way at all. God has kept them in an amazing way where they should have been swept into the sea. It's because God has a plan for them. But they're not dwelling safely. But they will now, at this time. And so it has to be, I believe, that it's the Antichrist that has allowed the peace. Because it's not in the millennium, because there is this attack that occurs. And we see clearly it is when Israel is at peace. Look at verse 11. It says, you will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. So the Northern Alliance led by Russia will attack a land of unwalled villages. What does that mean? Well, if you haven't got a wall around your, your town, it means that you're feeling fairly safe. I will go to a peaceful people, completely at peace. That's not Israel described at the moment, who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Can you see that? There has to be something that will happen for them to feel that way. And as I say to me, the only explanation is this Antichrist that will make this peace treaty with them. And as you continue on, let's drop down to verse 14 and, and just focus on that last part where it says, On that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? In other words, you know, they'll not know it. The enemy will not know it. They won't know what's about to happen as such. But Israel is dwelling safely in their own minds. So it's clearly in the latter days. We see that again there in verse 16. It will be in the latter days, middle of the verse, that I will bring you against my land. Notice God says Israel is his land so that the nations may know me when I'm haloed in you. So you can see that. So I believe that we get a clue from some of those things that we've looked at that the attack must occur when Israel feels like they are at peace and the only time that I know of that they will be feeling like they are at peace is when the Antichrist will give them that peace. So what's going to be the result of the attack? That's the other thing that we need to consider in all of this. And what we need to remember is that ultimately the Lord is in control because what you see in the last part of verse 16, the Lord says there, I am, when I am haloed in you, O God, before their, their eyes. God is, is showing us here, I believe, through all of this that he's in control. The nations will see. Notice going back further in verse 16, towards the end, so that the nations may know me when I'm haloed in you, God before their eyes, so that the nations may know me. Think about that for a moment. God is saying that as a result of this attack on Israel from the Northern Alliance, led by Russians, it is so that the nations may know me when I'm haloed in your eyes. Maybe we should just very quickly flick over back to, to Revelation and chapter 6. 
because there is something interesting that we can miss, but I believe it's very much in the context of what we are seeing here, Revelation in chapter 6, and you go through the seal judgments. Remember, I believe that they are all in the first half of the tribulation, and you see in verse 14 of Revelation chapter 6, it refers to the sky receding as a scroll when it is rolled up, verse 14, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. There's going to be some great havoc geographically that will happen. Verse 16, and said to the mountains and rocks, so the unsaved will be saying to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of, notice, of him. The judgment that will occur at this time, people that are unsaved, they will know it's from God. God will be haloed in their midst. In other words, they will recognize as God, they'll see his power, but they will not receive him. Who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. Perhaps that ties in as well. And so we see the Lord's holiness will be revealed. People will know. They won't receive him, but they'll know that God is judged, that he is powerful, that he is almighty. So much so that in their fear, they'll call out for the rocks to fall upon them rather than turn to the holy God. And so we continue on with that, back to Ezekiel 38. And we look at verses 18 through 20, and you describe what is happening and the way that God deals with this situation when, when Russia and its alliance attacks Israel. We pick it up in verse 18. It says, and it will come to pass at the same time when Gog comes against the land of Israel, this Russian alliance, says the Lord God that my fury will show in my face. God is going to do something to protect the nation of Israel, even though they are still predominantly unbelieving. Verse 19, For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken surely in that day, notice there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. And you see that described there in the first half of the tribulation. And there's going to be more earthquakes later on in the latter half of the tribulation. So it seems to tie in, as I said. Verse 20, you look at what it's saying there. So that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains, notice, shall be thrown down. The steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Next week, we'll look at why I believe in even more so that this will occur at the beginning of the tribulation time. So you can see there's this great shaking. It's interesting, I have a map here that shows some of the, the, the major faults, earthquake faults in Israel. You've got one coming down through here. You've got one that goes all the way down through the Dead Sea, all the way down through there. But there's going to be an almighty earthquake that will occur. And, uh, and that's going to destroy the enemy, this, this huge army that comes against Israel. So God will send a great, great earthquake. He's going to deal with it. And then there'll be division and destruction amongst the enemy. Let's read that in verses 21 and 22. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. They'll end up fighting each other in the confusion and I'll bring him to judgment, notice, with pestilence. There's going to be virus, disease and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding, rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Some people have tried to see... Uh, Nuclear warfare in that. Well, perhaps, but God doesn't need nuclear warfare either. Uh, but basically, they're going to be judged. They're going to be wiped out. God's going to deal with it. And then finally, I finish on this. The Lord will be magnified and known amongst the nations. Look there at verse 23. Thus, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord. 
We saw when we looked at Revelation that there will be a turning uh, to Christ. The 144,000 witnesses will, will minister to, to nations all throughout the world. There'll be many that will turn to the Lord. And perhaps as a result of even this here, there'll be some. Because it says there, the Lord will be known in the eyes of many nations. Perhaps there will be many that will turn to the Lord. But we see as you go on from here, the Antichrist will gain more and more power. And I believe it's a big part of the fact that this major enemy up in the north is dealt with. So God's going to allow the Antichrist to become more and more powerful. And so it is all about how that God will continue to judge the world. And so that in the end, Israel, who's been deceived by the Antichrist, at the end of the tribulation, they'll turn to the Lord and they'll recognise him as their Messiah. We've covered a lot of things very, very quickly, but I, I hope you can see that I think we have some good insights that it more than likely will be at the beginning of the tribulation. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Lord, these things are near because we do see them lining up. It's almost like a jigsaw puzzle being put together. And who would have thought 2,000 years or so ago, 2,500 years ago, that your prophet Ezekiel would write these things because they were from you and even though he would not have understood it, he was writing down that which is clearer to us today because we see these things developing. He would have been able to only write in that which he understood and yet we see these things more and more clearly in our day. It reminds us, Lord, that you could come back at any time. And then we know that there will be this wicked one, this Antichrist, that will make this peace treaty with Israel. They'll see him as the Messiah, and yet he is a false one. And they'll trust in him, and for a little while, just for a short while, they will dwell safely in the land only to have that destroyed by this alliance that comes down to attack Israel. And yet, Lord, you are in control of all these things because you are going to bring to pass that which is in your plan and in your time. Lord, it reminds us that the enemy so often would think that they are in control of all things. But no, Lord, you are in control. And nothing happens unless you allow it. We thank you for that. We trust in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.